Modern computers are complicated, with a lot of moving parts. Let's look at a model of the computer that allows us to focus on each of its parts and see how they work together to realize all the cool things computers can do. The starting point is a single uh, processing unit, which we will model as a square, uh, that can run a program stored in memory. So over here we have memory, and over here we have our program. This is our program, and this is our memory. Now the only thing a processing unit can do is to read some data from memory, perform some computation on it, and write back. When the program is done, uh, memory has been changed. So let's talk about the first device. The first device is another processing unit. So here we have our processing unit that is our basis for everything that we will do. And we will connect it to another processing unit. <clears throat> So this is our main processing unit, and this is our working processing unit. Uh, in our main processing unit, we have a program, and of course some memory. Now, now that we have connected a processing unit, let's call it the P2, to our processing unit, <coughs> we get additional instructions that allows us to interact with the other processing unit. So now, not only can we run a program in our main processing unit, but we can also send a message to uh, the other processing unit, asking it to perform some operation. Uh, after we have sent the message, our main processing unit can continue processing. The other processing unit will accept the message, and it has a program of its own over here. So the message will be accepted, uh, it will perform some operation and then produce an answer that it will send back. So it sends the answer back uh, and our main program will uh, fetch the answer. At this point, uh, our main processing unit can issue more commands to our worker uh, processing unit. We can, of course, connect multiple processing units to our processing unit. Let's connect um, four processing units. Now our main program has gained additional um, channels and it can interact with each of the workers to do much more computational work. So it can issue um, a computational assignment to this one, to this one, to this one, and to this one, and then wait for all of them to finish. So they will accept the message. Uh, do, everybody will do some computation in parallel, of course, and then answer back to the main program. That will then synchronize and accept all of the results. Now one thing to notice here is that this model works both on a single computer with multiple processors um, and it works um, as a distributed system. So this one can be hosted uh, separately. So let's say uh, this uh, processing unit here is hosted one place in one computer and these three are hosted on another computer. Let's now look at a second kind of device. <clears throat> the second device is a disk. And we will symbolize a disk as a cylinder. Now, and we'll connect the uh, disk to our main program, as usual. Now our main program 
has gotten additional uh, instructions, additional features. It, and what a disk does for us is to persist some uh, data. So when if our computer is shut off and power is removed and we turn the computer back on again, the data will still be stored on the disk. Uh, what our main program now can do is to issue a write command to the disk asking it to write some information. It can also issue a read command asking it to read out some information stored on the disk. Um, also, we can ask about the size of the disk. Now, one important uh, thing here we can do is that instead of connecting um, a processing unit directly to a, a physical disk device, we can connect it indirectly. So we have our physical disk device over here, and we have a processing unit device in between instead. So the processing unit is connected uh, here, and our main processing unit is connected here. So now for our main processing unit, it's connected to a worker processing unit that is connected to a disk. But now the worker processing unit exposes something else. It exposes a virtual disk. So this means that, our, that the main program interacts with processing unit W here as if it was a disk. Uh, and this is a highly useful um, construct that allows us to produce many interesting things. For example, for example, we can have multiple disks, multiple physical disks. Let's have three. Uh, each of these is connected to a processing unit that then exposes one virtual disk to our main processing unit. Now our main processing unit can, for example, interact with a virtual disk that is a combination of these three disks. So let's say that this <clears throat> program in between here uh, does a linear combination of these three disks, meaning that the virtual disk has the same size as the sum of the three disks over here. Let's look at a third kind of device. So the third device I'll cover is the is a clock device. So we connect the clock device to our uh, processing unit. Now our processing unit will get additional instructions that allows it to read uh, the current time. It should be noted at this point that we have the three most important uh, devices for creating server-based systems. Uh, Server-based systems are usually located on physical or virtual servers that have uh, multiple processing units, a disk containing the database, and of course a clock for doing timeouts and other time-related uh, operations. When communicating over the internet, um, the processing unit on the customer's or client's machine interacts with processing units on the server center. Let's now look at two devices that are very important for workstation and desktop environments. Uh, the fourth device is a screen device. So as usual, we connect the device to our, process, to our main processing unit. <clears throat> the main processing unit now, get, get, now gets a number of new features. It can ask the screen to display an image and it can ask uh, whether the image has been successfully synchronized or uh, written to the screen. This allows us to produce smooth animations. A very use, common use case for virtual screens is as follows. 
uh, we will have a screen device over here instead and we have a processing unit in between that is connected to the screen uh, this uh, processing unit here exposes for example three virtual screens they're all exposed by this system here and our main processing unit is connected to these three virtual screens. Now our processing unit can draw images to each of the separate screens. And this processing unit over here draws these uh, three screens in a, in a special way to the actual screen. And we might call this one a window manager. And let's draw how the screen may be laid out under here. So the first screen might be, for example, drawn here as a window. The second screen might be drawn behind here. And the third screen here. And each of these windows are a virtual screen exposed by the window manager. Three important devices usually associated with the screen device is a keyboard device, a mouse device or a touch screen device. Uh, for example, a computer can have two screens uh, with two independent keyboards and mice or a touch screen uh, for each. This allows multiple people to use uh, a single computer. Let's now look at a second kind of device that is important for uh, workstation and desktop environments. Uh, number five is audio. Again, an audio device is connected to our main processing unit. Now our main processing unit gets a number of new features. <clears throat> it can now send audio data to the audio device to be played. And it can ask how long um, or the current play position of the audio stream and send more audio data when uh, the audio stream gets empty. These five devices can be combined to produce most of the uh, different features we see on computers and server-based systems today. If you would like to learn more about what instructions are exposed by each of these devices, then check out separate videos for each of the device type. If you would like to see how these devices can be combined to produce different architectural building blocks, then check out separate videos for the many fascinating architectural building blocks we can construct from these. If you found this video interesting and would like to learn more, check out the book Foundations of Computer Science available on Amazon.